Good afternoon, friends. Welcome back to Pediatric Classes. Today, we are going to discuss about a topic which I discussed in the recent National Pedicon. Uh, that is about hypoglycemia. It's a very important topic. I uh, hope you are all doing fine. I know the undergraduate exam also coming up. Uh, so, you have to prepare properly. This is a topic of interest not only for undergraduates but also for postgraduates and also practicing pediatricians. So, with this intro, I am uh, sharing my screen now. Okay, so this pediatric uh, hypoglycemia, why is it so important? This is important because it is one of the major metabolic emergencies at any age leading on to neurological sequelae. It is also an important presenting feature for many underlying endocrine or metabolic problems. So how can you actually define? The problem is like hypoglycemia cannot be defined as a, spe at a specific plasma glucose concentration because the thresholds for specific brain responses to hypoglycemia occur across a wide range of PG concentrations. And there are technical factors also which actually lead to inaccuracies in glucose determination. So you cannot actually say one particular value. But for all practical purposes, we take plasma glucose less than 55 milligram per deciliter as hypoglycemia, pediatric hypoglycemia. So, please note here, the plasma glucose is around 10 to 15 percent higher than the whole blood. That is a finger prick blood, which we actually do uh, routinely when a patient suddenly goes to your ER. This is what we do. Now, we do a finger prick blood. Also, you send for the blood for a uh, glucose estimation. But uh, note here, plasma glucose are always 10 to 15 percent higher than the whole blood. So, what exactly is this Ripple's triad? This is the triad. This will help us in confirming hypoglycemia. That means there is there are symptoms or signs consistent with hypoglycemia and you get a documented low plasma glucose concentration and there are relief of syndromes once the plasma glucose is normalized. So, if this three comes together, this is actually a triad or called Ripple's triad which helps in the diagnosis of hypoglycemia. So, how is this blood glucose maintained in the body? So, this is maintained by the complex interactions between insulin, which will help to lower the glucose, and also the opposite action. That means that counter-regulatory hormones like cortisol, epinephrine, etc. will help to raise the glucose level in our body. So, what happens? How does this insulin help in glucose metabolism? So, what happens is in the fed state, that is high glucose, okay? So high glucose, it will stimulate high insulin secretions, which will actually cause glycogen synthesis, increases the peripheral utilization of glucose and to also stimulate lipid synthesis. Whereas, it will inhibit the gluconeogenesis and also the ketogenesis. And uh, what happens in the fasting state? Fasting state, insulin level falls to less than 5 to 10 micro international units per ml or lower and counter regulatory hormones will be activated. So what happens then the ketone mobilization happens, ketones, free fatty acids all serving as alternate fuels for skeletal muscles and heart and then sparing uh, glucose or brain metabolism. Okay. So what are the etiologies for hyperinsulin? We say what are the etiologies for pediatric hypoglycemia? So hypoglycemia means there should be high insulin in our body which is trying to you know reduce the glucose. So certain situations like mm. hyperinsulinemic states as in genetic forms like uh, SUR that is sulfonyl urea receptor 1 and the KIR 6.2 uh, defects or the glutamate dehydrogenase defects, glucokinase deficiencies or a beckwith man syndrome. You all know back with management syndrome, no? a newborn baby, a uh, big uh, born with hypo. Then when you check there is hypoglycemia, there is a big baby, there is macroglossia. But please note here, when you actually see the in this vacuum, you won't get any history of maternal diabetes mellitus. Uh, so we also, uh, that particular case, we won't get a history of maternal diabetes in case of maternal witness syndrome back with Bidman syndrome and um, there can be say cases such as islet cell tumor which are actually increasing the insulin levels in our body or factitious hyperinsulinemia when it is administered or hormone deficiencies like pan hypopituitary these are the counter regulatory hormones which will help to increase the glucose level so once there is a deficiency of such hypo counter regulatory hormones like as in case of pan hypopituitarism isolated GA deficiency primary adrenal insufficiency like in addison ch or glucagon or epinephrine ACTA deficiencies, 
or as in case of glycogen storage disorders, substrate limited disease, that is a ketotic hypoglycemia or maple syrup urine disease. I'll be discussing in detail about this ketotic hypoglycemia at the end of the session. Okay, it's a very important cause of hypoglycemia. Others like disorders of gluconeogenesis, enzyme defects as in galactosemia, fructose intolerance, disorders of fatty oxidation, child abuse or hydrogenic, that is drug abuse, salicylate, oral sulfonylureas, etc. or beta blockers. Abrupt discontinuation of IV fluids containing high concentration of glucose. This is what we always say when we actually find a hypoglycemia and you give a bolus for hypoglycemia, please back it up with uh, IV glucose dextrose infusions for some time. Otherwise, what will happen is suddenly the discontinuation of glucose that will itself cause a rebound hypoglycemia. Uh, another one thing I wanted to tell you is uh, whenever like, you know, uh, this is conditions arises, we need to actually properly work it up so that we get the diagnosis of hypoglycemia also, not only the management, in that management you have to find out the etiology also. So what are the clinical features? They can have autonomic symptoms and the patient can have neuroglycopenic symptoms. Autonomic symptoms is because of the activation of the counter regulatory hormones like palpitations, tremor, anxiety, sweating, hunger, tingling, etc. Whereas neuroglycopenic symptoms is because there's decreased glucose. So in the may, patient may present with confusion, headache, lethargy, seizures, personality changes, coma, etc. So what exactly are the history you will elicit from the patient or the patient by sinus? That is the epistis, the hypoglycemia timing and its relationship to food, duration and nature of symptoms. You also need to ask about neonatal history about the birth weight, gestational age, any intrauterine infections, etc. History of any fetal death in the siblings, parent consanguinity you need to ask. And in the examination, please look carefully because we will may get a clue to your diagnosis. Like for example, See, here, the, when you get to see a patient with a micropenis or a cleft lip or palate and the patient is, is having hypoglycemia, it may be a case of uh, hypopituitarism. If there is recurrent abdominal pain, hyperpigmentation, anorexia, weight loss, maybe because of adrenal disorders that the patient is landing up in hypoglycemia or the patient has other than hypoglycemia, omphalocele, hemihypertrophy, microglossia, etc., it may be a buck with Wiedemann syndrome. And if there's hepatomegaly, consider a diagnosis of glycogenolysis defect. And uh, if there's a cataract, it may be galactosemia. If there is hypoglycemia plus sweaty feet order, it may be isovaleric acidemia. If there is hypoglycemia plus boiled cabbage order, it may be tyrosinemia. And there are lots and lots of clues which we can actually get from a proper clinical examination. So what are the investigations you will send? We may send some baseline investigations and also we can send uh, extra investigations also as a pertaining to the case. So anyway, the basic in, uh, investigations include plasma glucose. We need to send insulin, beta hydroxybutyrate, free fatty acids, lactate, pyruvate. We need to find out the pH, bicarbonate, ammonia. And other investigations like ask the case maybe like you can send a C-peptide. What is the importance of the C-peptide? In the case of endogenous insulin secretion, whenever the insulin is secreted, there is also a secretion of C-peptide. Like I told you, you know, child abuse. Suppose somebody is exogenously administering an insulin to a child and the child lands up to you, lands to you in the ER as hypoglycemia. In such a patient, if you actually see Okay, definitely if you see the level of high insulin will may be high, but what happens is the level of C-peptide, it will be normal. So please note here, in all cases of endogenous insulin secretions, it is insulin secretion is accompanied by a secretion of C-peptide along with it. Then uh, we can do a hormone levels, cortisol, ACH. TH. All this, please understand, they are counter-regulatory hormones. We can do an ACTH stimulation test, total and free carnitine and acetyl carnitine levels, drug screening, and we may also need to screen the urine for ketones. So this is one very important uh, diagram, which actually flowchart, which I got. It's uh, very uh, you know, self-explanatory. If there is a hypo, sorry, if there is a hypoglycemia, so what happens is like if you actually uh, do all this, that is, you do a bicarb. That is, you do a pH. You do a bicarb. 
beta hydroxy butyrate due to lactate free fatty acids these three things we can do no anyway when the patient comes you have to be taking checking the sugar why do you do at least a bicarb beta hydroxy butyrate lactate and a free fatty acids if there is acidosis if there is no acidosis that's first thing so first we make sure the patient is having hypoglycemia immediately find out whether the patient has an acidosis or not if there is no acidosis and if the beta hydroxy butyrate levels and free fatty acids levels are low it is a simple it is a case of genetic hyperinsulinism so please note here in case of genetic hyperinsulinism the ph will be normal it may also be a case of hypopituitarism in newborns or a transitional uh, neonatal hypoglycemia or perinatal stress hyperinsulinism so but if there is no acidemia and if the beta hydroxy butyrate levels are less but the free fatty acid levels are high we consider a diagnosis of fatty acid oxidation defects now the second limb that is the patient we have done uh, by car beta hydroxy butyrate lactate free fatty acids etc but here in this particular patient you are seeing an acidosis so once there is an acidosis look for the level of lactate If the lactate is high it may be a gluconeogenesis defect but if the beta hydroxy butyrate that is the ketone levels are high it may be a case of ketotic hypoglycemia glycogenosis or uh, gh deficiencies cortisol deficiencies etc so what the point i want to stress here is this flow chart i think you can have a picture of this flow chart in your uh, ear or even on your table for easy reference so you i repeat here i find in a patient with hypoglycemia do a bicarb beta hydroxy butyrate lactate and free fatty acids in addition to all this uh, glucose level estimations and if there is acidosis what happens this is the second this uh, the limb for that and you check for the levels of lactate beta hydroxy butyrate etc if there is no acidosis this will be the limb Le look for the level of beta hydroxy butyrate and free fatty acids depend on it you can again further divide which i have already explained now how can you diagnose hyperinsulinism i told one of the major causes of hypoglycemia is hyperinsulinism so how can we diagnose there is rapid development of hypoglycemia with fasting that means the patient has not had food for less than 4 hours also the patient lands up in hypoglycemia consider a diagnosis of hyperinsulinism iv glucose requirement is more than 10 to 12 mg per g per minute that means high glucose requirement insulin glucose ratio is more than 0.3 to 0.5 exaggerated glucagon response that is the plasma glucose rising very rapidly more than 30 mg per deciliter when a 30 microgram per kg of glucagon im or sc is subcutaneous is given and there is no ketones ketonemia or ketonuria or acidosis this is what i just now told no in hyperinsulinism i want me to put the hyperinsulinism slide they just revert back and see there there is no acidosis there is no ketosis and in such a patient if there is rapid development of hypoglycemia high glucose require iv glucose requirement and the ratio of insulin glucose is more than 0.3 to 0.5 and there is an exaggerated glucagon response always it may be a case of hyperinsulinism now what exactly how exactly you are going to manage the hypoglycemia and that is like very simple so please please understand if it is an asymptomatic hypoglycemia yes you can consider internal feeds and but if the symptoms are there it always uh, to be recurred that we should give iv glucose so what exactly we are giving we are giving 2 ml per kg of 10% dextrose so please note here 2 ml per kg of 10% dextrose and then we have to back it up with an continuous infusion of around 6 to mg 8 mg per kg per minute if hypoglycemic seizures are present then the dose is 4 ml per kg of 10% dextrose so say okay please note and check the glucose level 15 minutes after the initial bolus and if it is less than 50 give another bolus always note here we have to back it up with a infusion of continuous infusion of glucose and if the patient we can also in that patient can also try glucagon 30 mg per kg iv or im to release the preformed glycogen from the liver also can be hydrocort 5 to 10 mg per kg in free divided doses can be considered so what is the specific treatment for persistent hyperinsulinemic states are like uh, disosox disoxide which will stabilize the beta potassium atp channel in the open state Uh, so let me take a second here to you know trying to explain to you what exactly is the 
glucose metabolism or the insulin secretion part. So this is a very good diagram are given in physiology textbooks and uh, medicine textbooks. What is this? there is there is a cell. We have a glute glu transporter. What happens? The glucose comes into the glute transporter, gets converted to but uh, ATP is generated, which will actually block the sodium potassium the ATP uh, potassium ATP channel. So this potassium will not be leaving. So what happens? This will actually cause depolarization, which will actually open the calcium channel and will cause a calcium influx, which will actually cause the release of insulin eventually and will decrease the glucose in the uh, body. I'm sorry, I could not put up a diagram of it. It's very beautifully given in your physiology books. Uh, even in our, I, our uh, Nelson, it is there. It is there in Opiga, it is there in uh, all Harrison's, everywhere it is there. Please go refer back it. So, because if you understand that relief, then we'll understand what happens when we give disoxide. When we give disoxide, what happens? It stabilizes the potassium ATP channel in the open state. So, there is no depolarization, no opening of calcium channels, no release of insulin, etc., and it will reduce the calcium uh, insulin levels in our body. But along with it, I will give hydrochlorothiazide because that will take care of the fluid retention part. Then, long acting somatostatic analog. Please note here, can be a MCQ for you, and that is octreotide. That is 5 mics program per kg per day in divided 6 to 8 hourly MCQ. Maximum 40 mics per kg, uh, maximum 40 microgram per day can be tried. Oral feeding, adequate calories, carbohydrate rich sugar, and raw cornstarch should be encouraged. Frequent feeds, then in cases if there is no response to medical management of PHHI, consider Surgical management that is partial pancreatectomy or a near tranquillectomy in case of persistent hyperinsulinemic states. Now, a word about ketotic hypo hypoglycemia. This is very commonly encountered in our uh, ears. That's why I told I'll take some time here to explain you all these things. So, this refers to children who have an abnormally shortened uh, fasting tolerance. Mostly, it is seen in 18 months to 5 years and it generally remits by around 8 years of life. What happens when the child is not well? Like for example, the child is having a disease or the child is keeping an evening meal. So they have an abnormally shortened fasting tolerance and they land up with symptoms of hypoglycemia. In such patients, if you see, their alanine levels will be low. This is another neat entrance question can be. So, in a case of high ketotic hypoglycemia, the alanine levels will be low. The patient have low insulin levels. The patient, when you check, actually there is ketonuria. I told you in the first flow chart, if there is acidosis and there is ketonuria, ketonemia, all consider a diagnosis of ketotic hypoglycemia. And how exactly can we treat? Avoid starvation. Frequent feeds of high protein, high carbohydrate diet. And if required IV glucose, as in the dose mentioned above, that is 2 ml per kg of 10% dextrose uh, in symptomatic hypoglycemia. But if there are seizures, you have to give 4 ml per kg and back it up with continuous infusion of Now, what about the recurrence? It recurs in around 10 to 15 percent of infants after adequate treatment. And recurrence is more if the sorry. Yeah, one second. Yeah, if the IV fluids are stopped uh, very rapidly, I told you before, no, there can be a rebound hypoglycemia, or in the it's an extra vestigial, you don't know the we are thinking the fluid is running, but the fluid may not be running for the child. And uh, that's one case. What about the prognosis? They have got an excellent prognosis for hypoglycemia of short duration. Prognosis is guarded if it is prolonged, recurrent, and severe symptomatic hypoglycemia is present. So this is in short about uh, the hypoglycemia in pediatrics. So please, uh, if you have understood and if you find this session useful, please do like it comment and share with your friends and my dear undergraduate students another request uh, if any particular topics or uh, practical sessions you need before your exams i know the exams are coming uh, the practicals are uh, starting uh, soon so if uh, some class or something you require you please do message okay thank you and stay safe